The OSG Sports app is up and running on your Android or iPhone. All you got to do, install the OSG Sports app and listen to our podcast from college football, soccer, lacrosse. What are you waiting for? Let's get this done. Get the OSG Sports app today. Welcome to the College Football Debrief on the CFB on OSG with your host, the online sports guys. Tommy Palmer, thanks, and we welcome you to the College Football Debrief. John Wilkerson here, Anthony Goldman there, and we thank you for listening to us on Spreaker, SoundCloud, Stitcher Radio, uh, iTunes, wherever you're, Spotify, wherever you're catching your podcasts. Anthony and I are back after a week hiatus. The big reason for the big hiatus, uh, Anthony, was we had to bid adieu to the padded room. And yes, we did. It, it has served us well, John. It served us well. But, you know, we have a good setup now. I'm actually in the Alabama room right now. So I'm at my house, comfy and cozy. I can see that you are in your uh, white office. Yes, well, it's uh, <laughs> it was new paint job here in the uh, office HQ. Uh, Thanks. To see here. So, uh, yes, uh, very white and very bright. So, Anthony. You ready to talk uh, games from last weekend? Man, I've been waiting on this all week. Let's do it, bud. Okay, well, obviously the big story has been the SEC East and what happened there. And let's start with the big one, Anthony. Georgia State going into (laughs) Neyland Stadium and basically having their way with Tennessee, winning 38-30. Anthony, what can you say about this that hasn't been said already? Uh, I mean, everything's been said, but I'll sum it up the best I can, John. And look, I mean, this is the first true loss that I could think of for Jeremy Pruitt where you can chalk it up to coaching. A hundred percent it was ch- coaching. You know, you got plays where two men are on the – two ends are on the same side of the ball. You got guys blocking the wrong people, receivers running the wrong routes. They just did not look very well coached at all. And – You could talk about both lines of scrimmages get blown off the ball. You could talk about the mistakes that were made. But I think poor coaching is where this begins and ends, John. And, you know, what really worries me about this Tennessee team, and I know we'll talk about this looking at this upcoming game with BYU, is there are a lot of rumors coming out. And I'm hearing this, and you might be hearing this too, that I don't know if these players are wanting to play for this coaching staff. And more importantly, for this head coach. And when you watch them on Saturday, it looked to me like a team that did not want to play for their head coach. The, the last three times that we've seen them, the end of the year last year, Missouri, you know, the Missouri game and then the Vanderbilt game, and then this game, this is three performances in a row where they've looked flat and uninspired. And that's on the coaching staff. And this is coming from a guy that's a big Jeremy Pruitt fan. Yeah, I I tend to agree with you in that assessment. Uh, It just looks like they're just going through the motions and very uninspired. And, you know, this is the first game of the season, and Georgia State came in, basically got about a million-dollar paycheck to fund their athletic program. Oh, by the way, they got a win. It was very tough for me to watch this game because – you think of Tennessee and you think of a team that's, that's an SEC blue blood, but man, after the whole Butch Jones fiasco a couple of years ago, and now this, this has got to hurt. This is a setback, and this is arguably the worst loss in the modern era for this program. I mean, if you look back, you know, let's not talk about 1929 when they might have lost to Cumberland or somebody. In the most recent time that we can remember, this has got to be the hardest loss this program's had, and this fan base feels pretty hopeless right now. Um, It gets interesting because now, you know, we said in the preview, John, we said this was a seven-win team at best, probably six-win team, maybe five-win team. Seven is now out the door. And -hmm. not only that, you have to win on Saturday if you're getting a six. If they lose to BYU, they're not going bowling. I can promise you that. We'll talk a little later about uh, Tennessee's next matchup uh, with the Cougars. Uh, But um, let's let's move on as we stay in the uh, SEC East. Old Miss and Memphis. And well, actually, this is SEC West. uh, But I want to include the the Old Miss Rebels here. 
going to Memphis and really Rich Rodriguez's offense kind of laid an egg. Not a good start for his tenure offensively for Ole Miss. And now where the Rebels go from here, because they got a huge game, really, uh, almost a must-win game in week two. Yeah, this is one of my uh, games I'm most looking forward to is this Arkansas game at Ole Miss on Saturday. Um, You know, the thing about Ole Miss this past week, the offense looked bad. We, I mean, that's obvious to say. Matt Corral really struggled. They never had a rhythm, not only throwing the ball, but running the ball. Memphis's defense, which is not very good, by the way, looked like gangbusters in this game, and there was a lot of miscommunication. Um, I will say, though, on the positive, I was really, really impressed with uh, Mike McIntyre's defense. I was, too. I thought that they played outstanding, and they gave their team every chance to win in this game. Uh, you know, we knew, John, that Ole Miss's offense is young. They have the true freshman quarterback. Uh, They have a lot of freshmen at skill positions. They're still waiting on somebody to step up at running back. I really think they may have something in Jerrion Ely. Uh, With him doing the special teams on kickoff returns, he was very explosive. I'd like to see him get the ball more. But this is going to be a work in progress for Rich Rod trying to figure out what he can do. And I was a little surprised, John. I don't know about you. I was surprised we didn't see more uh, RPOs and more read options because Matt Corral has a little bit of speed. The only touchdown they scored is set up by running. So he's got a little bit of scrambling ability. I was surprised they didn't use that more. I think that's something they will use this Saturday. I agree. Uh, and that's got to be part of the repertoire. That's that's part of Rich Rodriguez's offense, and it needs to be part of it as they move on against Arkansas. Uh, let's go back to the SEC East. Kind of jumped the gun there, Anthony. Went went west uh, on you, but uh, let's stay in the East. North Carolina and South Carolina. And have we seen the uh, the legend of Sam Howell uh, begin in Chapel Hill? Uh, because, you know, you and I were kind of lukewarm on North Carolina going into the season. And we, we were somewhat high on South Carolina. I'm not ready to flip both ways, but, um, you know, South Carolina just looked way too conservative, uh, offensively. And, uh, of course, uh, now we know about the, the injury, uh, that Jake Bentley kind of disturbs me that some t- South Carolina fans were kind of cheering that on. I just felt South Carolina just was way too conservative in that game. Well, South Carolina, John, they coached this game not to lose. And guess yeah, what? Yeah, you're right. They lost. They lost. You never do that. <laughs> I mean, that. yeah, that was their game plan. They were coaching not to lose. They got up on this team by double digits. They do their play to true freshman quarterback, and they got conservative, and they thought that they could keep the ball in front of them. They put all the pressure on their defense. And to Sam Howell's credit, he started making throws. Um, you know, a lot was made of Jake Bentley, the incomplete pass in the end zone, which would have won the game. The fourth quarter – the true freshman looked like the four-year senior and vice versa. That, that's been talked about a lot. But let's talk about what led up to that. You know, South Carolina had the ball, John. Fourth go, fourth and one in North Carolina's territory. And they elected to punt. And they punt. Yeah. They pinned yes. North Carolina deep. And yes. they get them at their own two-yard line. And you're like, okay, you, you went conservative, but you're making them drive 98 yards. Yeah. Well, guess what happened? They, they drove 98 yards. And yeah. – during that drive, South Carolina, there were some good throws that were made, some pinpoint throws by Howell, but watch the secondary. They never get their heads around. They look so confused back there, and their technique was very poor. And this just felt to me like a team that was waiting to lose. And look, you know, mm-hmm. we thought the South Carolina team was going to be better, but their schedule wouldn't show it. This was another loss that now – your six wins is going to be hard to get, and you got to get those six wins, or you're going to be looking for a new coach. Yeah, and already Will Muschamp is um, said that he they're evaluating everything now, and uh, that's not a good position to be after week one of the college football season. Now, you, you and I, for the last three years, when we've done this, we've we've always kind of talked about the uh, uh, what, the overreactions after week one. Oh yeah, uh, and. This is this is one of them. I mean, obviously, the injury to Jake Bentley is going to hurt. When you go into after week one, you're starting to evaluate everything again after a spring practice and 15 practices in fall camp. That's tough. 
That is tough. And look, I want to preface this. I don't think, I don't want to speak for you, but I think you're on the same page as I am. I'm not counting Tennessee or South Carolina for dead. I think they both have much better football in them. And it's week one. You know, teams are rusty. People like to overreact, but there's much more potential in both of these teams. My concern, and I think your concern as well, is both of their schedules don't allot them for any errors now. And if these teams are going to be what we thought they could be, which are, you know, seven win, six win bowl teams, they have no room for error now. And now in Tennessee, you might have to win a game that you weren't favored in before. That, right. That's my concern with both of these two teams. Now, the team we're about to talk about in a minute, th- that's a totally different concern. And that would be the Missouri Tigers who went into Laramie, Wyoming to take on the Wyoming Cowboys and came back with a loss. And uh, already we're hearing, uh, if, you, if you're if you one to examine Twitter all the time, you're already seeing that uh, uh, Barry Odom is being told he's a really good defensive coordinator. Well, the way Mizzou's defense played in that game uh, – it's it's uh that could be an argument. The the thing is, this is what really interested me in this Wyoming Missouri game is this Missouri was the second SEC team to go to Laramie, and the second SEC team to lose. Ole Miss lost, I think it was thirteen fourteen years ago, and so if you're an SEC team, don't schedule Wyoming at Laramie. <laughs> it's the Bermuda Triangle, <laughs> uh, but. Uh, just the way Wyoming was moving on that defense of Missouri, when you and I kind of, kind of, that was a concern to our of ours as far as the, the success with Mizzou. You know, Wyoming just out physical at the on their offensive line a a uh, SEC defense in Mizzou. Oh, without question. And first of all, let me go back to what you just said. Yes, if you're an SEC team, you should never be going on the road in, to Laramie anyways. What were they doing going to Wyoming, John? Doesn't Missouri know we don't do that in the Southeastern Conference? Well, We don't do that. What, they're 10 years in the league right now? I mean, no, they, they, they have not uh, examined the back page of the Code of Conduct. No, they have not. They know better. But, yeah, going back to this defense, what shot me about this defense was – the running they got ran all over in this game and what's surprising about that is you'll see teams pop up and we'll see this probably this coming up week there will be a group of five team that runs all over a power five team but one thing that usually connects that is the group of five team will run a system which benefits the run game for example army and their triple option or zone read spread some team that runs a gimmick type of run offense That is not what Wyoming does, John. They lined up and just ran the football. They ran the ball just like LSU, just like Arkansas, just like any old normal team. And that's a bad sign if you're Missouri. That is a bad sign. rest of the SEC went pretty well. Georgia, boy, did they look strong. Did LSU look strong? Uh, Can I stop you real quick uh, before we get off Missouri? I wanted to ask you your take because we talked a lot, you know, about this Missouri team and what they could be. Uh, Some people had them as a surprise team this year's Kentucky. We thought they had that potential. We bought into it. And I'm not saying that it's done, but we said that it all lies in what happens at the quarterback position. Have you changed your thought after seeing the quarterback performance for Missouri from week one? Not really. I mean, I think we know Kelly Bryant's uh, body of work. It is what it is with Kelly Bryant. What I was concerned about is Larry Roundtree was hardly used. Uh, And when he was... And when he was used, he just wasn't effective. You know, that spells concerns of their offensive line. Can they run block? And that's the key for Larry Roundtree. Yeah, the guy can open his own holes if he wants to, but he can't do it on a consistent basis. And uh, so that's got to be addressed. But I I think you and I, as close as, uh, to ACC programs we were, uh, we know the body of work at Kelly Bryant. And I was not surprised uh, – of his performance. He looked like the same Kelly Bryant I saw two years ago, uh, take Clemson to an ACC championship. Uh, yeah, but he I, just I doesn't have that, the weapons that he no, had. I, I didn't think that he lost them the game at all, but he was just very inconsistent. He had some good moments, made some good plays, but he also turned the ball over, particularly in the red zone. So I, I, I still think that he can help them get where they want to be offensively. But he's got to grow before they can lean on him to win the ball games. 
All right, let's move on. Danthony, I got a question for you. What would you got? Would you rather be the Tennessee fan base or the Florida State fan base? Oh, man. That's a good question. You know, (laughs) I might go Tennessee, to be honest. I I might go Tennessee because at least you live in the mountains. (laughs) Um, yeah, that's great. You know, uh, Florida state in that first half, I, I was impressed with them. I thought they used cam Akers the way he should be used. James Blackman came out comfortable. Uh, everything clicked on Kendall Bryles' offense. Uh, what alarmed me from the beginning was Robert Mahone of Boise state was getting good runs up the middle. I mean, he was getting, he was moving the chains. He was getting like eight yards. And that was kind of the first red flag for me with Florida state. And then Hank Buckmeyer, the true freshman quarterback for Boise state. Yeah. He was getting harassed, but he was still hand tough in the pocket and making plays. And it was almost like it demoralized the Florida state defensive line because they were still getting that kind of pressure but they weren't, it wasn't effective. Uh, he, Buck Meyer was still making plays. Mahone was getting some good runs. George Halani was, was uh, effective. You know, I just think it kind of wore down Florida State to where Boise State kind of took command. This, this is a hard, hard loss for Florida State. This, you know, they had everything going for them in the first half, but there were some red flags at the beginning I saw, and it just wasn't the B for the Seminoles. Doesn't this game, though, kind of sum up in a nutshell what the last four years of this program has been? Well, I I mean, it felt uh, like we lived through the last four years in a 60-minute game, did we not? Yeah, I mean, think about two years ago against Alabama, a loss, and you lose your starting quarterback. And then last year, obviously, the, the, the bad performance against Virginia Tech and uh, on national television, and now this a game that was supposed to be in Jacksonville, but because of the uh, the hurricane, was hastily moved to, to Tallahassee, and there was no atmosphere at Doe Campbell Stadium. It was not even half full uh, for this one. Yeah, what does this mean for Willie Taggart? Because <sighs> that, I, is, that's a good question. I mean, look, there's a lot to unpack with this game, John, and you mentioned it. You know. Florida State came out, and they looked very crisp. I loved the plan that Kendall Browse had. I thought that they attacked his Boise State defense extremely well, especially on the perimeter. And defensively, when you have a fast-paced offense, you're going to be on the field a lot. But the key to that is you got to force turnovers. And they did that in the first half, and they made Hank Bachmeyer look like a true freshman. The problem was halftime happens – and all of a sudden, Boise State makes those coaching adjustments. Mm-hmm. And Hank Bachmeyer does not look like a freshman anymore. He starts to gel and complete passes. And when he did, Florida State panicked. And to me, there's a lot of ways you can break this down. You could talk about the secondary. You can talk about you know, getting vanilla on offense for Florida State, wherever you want to go. To me, it all boils down to this, John. In that late third quarter, all throughout the rest of the game, I saw one team – that knew how to win, and one team that believed they were going to win. And I saw another team that was waiting on something to happen. And I don't know if Willie Taggart can change the mental mindset of this program right now to turn them into believing that they're winners. And I think that is one of the many underlying problems right now in Tallahassee. Yeah, those are are great points. Third year in a row that Florida State has just laid an egg in the opening uh, opening week of the season, that, that that's just not doesn't bode well uh, for that program. And you know, I think it's going to be hard pressed. Well, I got to see what they do uh, this coming week because they, they may be hard pressed to match that five win total if this keeps spiraling downhill. I want to touch well, on one here, other. Here's the Go thing. Ahead. Here's the thing, real quick. You know, this team is talented. This team is very, very talented. talented. But. Let's be honest. You mentioned, you know, the game being moved to Tallahassee. You mentioned the atmosphere. To me, John, the deck was stacked against Boise because yes. you're having to move venues less than 48 hours before kickoff. You're now playing at noon Eastern, which is 9 a.m. your time, and you're playing in the hot Tallahassee sun in the heat of the day. And then you're going to, if you're Willie Tackert, yeah. 
he's the one complaining about cramps and overheating? Are you well, kidding me? There, like, don't some... bring that crap to me. Th- this was totally <laughs> stacked against Boise, in my opinion. So I well, have no sympathy for that. There, there's some people in Boise, Idaho, that are listening to this going, it gets pretty damn hot in August in uh, in Boise. Uh, you, Zero you just don't humidity, have the crushing John. humidity. Zero humidity. <laughs> you just don't have the crushing Zero humidity, humidity, yes. I just want to touch on one other game, actually two other games in the ACC, just real briefly, because Boston College and Virginia Tech and BC, they just look the same BC type of team. AJ Dillon didn't do anything spectacular; he was just effective. Uh, but to me, Virginia Tech, they just seem to me that they are just on a downward spiral. Ryan Willis had decent numbers. They just didn't seem to have any firepower, or and and Boston College just really out physical them. Yeah, well, I agree with you. You know, and I know that you've been down on uh, Virginia Tech this year, but I'll be honest, John. I thought Ryan Willis played really well. I mean, he threw for over three hundred yards, almost three hundred fifty yards. And if you watched up front, I actually thought Virginia Tech's offensive line was getting a push. Um, they were winning a lot of their battles. The problem with them was turnovers. They couldn't hold on to the ball. I mean, you're plus four in turnover margin. Yeah, exactly. You're plus four in turnover margin. You're not beating a team like Boston College. Uh, Boston College, you know, they got stopped. A.J. Dillon got bottled up. He wasn't able to run. But what impressed me about it was, number one, they didn't panic. Number two, the quarterback came in, and he steps up, and he carried this team. And I think that was really important for the confidence for this team. I think that they needed that type of performance from Anthony Brown to believe that they can do that and believe that he can get it done whenever the running game's not working. I mean, I know he only threw for you know 275 yards and two touchdowns, but he made passes and completed when they need to. And there was, what, like a five-minute span where they scored 21 points? That was all it took. That was all it took with the way that they were playing and the way that the Hokies just couldn't hold on to the football. The other game uh, was Monday night, Louisville and Notre Dame. You and I have sung the praises of Scott Satterfield. That game Monday night just proved, and no, Notre Dame did come out slow, uh, but they they got a, they got the win. It just proved that last year at Louisville they had quit on Bobby Petrino. And Satter, Scott Satterfield comes in, and really with this roster, to do that, have that kind of performance against Notre Dame, I thought was a great way, coaching job, a great way to use your 15 spring practices and your 15 practices in fall camp. And this Louisville team just looks completely different. Well, they play with a lot of heart, like you said. They were motivated to play for this team. They're motivated to play for this coach, and they played over their heads. You know, I, I was impressed with them. Um, it did not change what I think this team is. I still think no, this team same is here. a black hole of talent. But I think that they're fighting hard, and they're going to take their lumps. But if they can stay aggressive and stay motivated like they were last night, they will get a team or two that they maybe weren't supposed to, or maybe we didn't see them getting. Uh, it was a good start. You know, for Notre Dame, they started slow out the gate, and that's okay. It's week one. Uh, I, I didn't throw too many red flags up on Notre Dame, but the one thing, John, that did worry me, if I'm a fighting Irish fan, was the fact that you could not stop the run. You were yeah. getting ran off all over by Louisville and all of a sudden Javion Hawkins looks like a stud running back, the freshman from Louisville. I think Hawkins is a good player, but you shouldn't be getting ran over like that. And that really worries me in a couple of weeks when you go between the hedges. Yeah, it should. Lastly, let's go to the PAC 12 Auburn and Oregon, uh, in, uh, Arlington. Obviously we've, we've started the legend of Bo Nix. Uh, what a performance yeah. there. But I, I want to go in the Oregon angle right now because we know we both talked about the pressure that's on Oregon carrying the Pac-12 conference. A second year in a row, they don't get it done against Auburn. Are we going to see the same? Is it going to affect the conference the same way the Washington lost it last year? Yeah, I think so. I, I think, honestly, this conference, I, I hate to say this because it's really it sounds hurtful, but it's the truth. I think this conference's playoff hopes are over with. I, I think – Oregon's going to have a great year. 
Oregon, you know, they could be a one loss team. I think they'll lose another. I think they're probably a 10 and two team. This is a very competitive conference in the Pac-12, John. We enjoy watching this conference. A lot of good teams and some good coaches, but Oregon was that bell cow. And now that they've lost, bye-bye to a playoff spot for the Pac-12. I- I'm going to go ahead and call it now. And, of course, Southern Cal gets the win over Fresno, uh, but JT Daniels is lost for the season. And uh, already a, a year that they have to win big uh, in, in Southern Cal. And Well, now they're going to have to uh, – you know, it's going to be an uphill climb. Yeah, the the loss to JT Daniels almost felt like losing the game, and now they have Stanford this week, which is another game that's going to be physical. It's going to be tough. They always play week two, um, and you're breaking in a new quarterback, and here you go. It's your chance. You know, I, every week this coaching staff at USC is coaching to stay on one more week. Clay Helton is coaching for his job, and this is going to be another really testing moment for this coaching staff. Can they adjust from the quarterback? Because JT Daniels was one of the better quarterbacks in this conference, and now he's out. So even with the win, John, it felt like a loss. And, oh, by the way, they did not dominate Fresno State either. Fresno State gave them all they could handle. They just wore down in the end. Anthony, how much fun is it to start talking about games? Oh, man, it is so much fun. We could do an 11-hour podcast. We we could just do this all day Marathon. long. Marathon. Marathon. And – uh uh, Anthony and I, we, we try to attend as many football games as we can. I'll be in Athens to watch uh, Georgia and Murray State play. And uh, when I buy my tickets, uh, Anthony, where do I go buy my tickets? John, you're going to go to SeatGiant.com. And what promo code are you going to use once you go there? I'm going to use the promo code SDH because it helps you. And it, and it helps, helps us. us. Exactly. at SeatGiant.com. Anthony and I are going to preview the games when we come back. The OSG Sports app is up and running on your Android or iPhone. Install the OSG Sports app and listen to our podcast from college football, soccer, and lacrosse. What are you waiting for? Get the OSG Sports app today. Hey, what's going on, y'all? This is Rock at the What's Up Falcons podcast, and I'm joined with my boys. My boys in the house, where you at? <laughs> oh, yeah. What up, what up? Oh, gee, and we have Q, and we have Hoop in the house. Q's here, <laughs> yeah, the most beloved yeah. guy in all of sports entertainment. Indeed. Hey, y'all, we want to thank everyone for listening to us, and if you want to listen to some great Falcons information, check us out on the What's Up Falcons podcast. Right, fellas? Right. Sir. Hey, we here every week, baby. We keeping it real, so check us out out there on twitter holla peace Peace. subscribe to the what's up falcons podcast on itunes and soundcloud listen to the what's up falcons podcast at whatsupfalcons.com the debrief is over Time to preview the games as the CFB on OSG continues. Here's Anthony Goldman and John Wilkerson. Okay, many big games this week, but the one big game that Anthony and I have been targeting really since last spring is what's taking place in Austin, Texas, as Texas hosts LSU at a rare regular season meeting between the Longhorns and the Tigers. 1954 was the last time they met in the regular season. And, boy, don't you love it when two college football blue bloods get together like this uh, early in the season? Well, this is a game that really should be an annual rivalry, I think, with two schools that are geographically pretty close to each other, John. Like you said, not a lot of regular season history, but a lot of postseason history. These two teams have played in quite a few bowl games. I think the 03 Cotton Bowl might have been their last meeting but they also battle on the recruiting trail year after year after year. And as we start breaking down this game, a couple of the key players in this game were kids that both schools were looking at. Some of them were committed to one school before flipping to the other school on signing day. So a lot of history between these two schools. And, John, don't forget, by the way, Ed Orgeron, I know he hasn't forgot, was picked up to be the LSU coach after LSU was turned down by... Tom Herman. Tom Herman. Yes. There's some I love that these coaching intrigues too. Yeah, you um, think Ed Orgeron remembers that? I think he does. 
I think you, there might be a little something extra for Tom Herman. I love this quarterback matchup between Joe Burrow and Sam Ellinger. These are two really tough guys, very similar skill sets, uh, guys that have galvanized their offense. Uh, everybody on those offense uh, respects those guys. And, um, yeah, I, I can't wait to see uh, this quarterback matchup uh, on Saturday. You're not going to find two tougher quarterbacks in all college football than these two. And like you said, they are the lifebloods of their offense. Now, both of them do it in different ways. Joe Burrow is more the methodical quarterback. He protects the ball, takes what the defense gives him. We'll talk about this new look passing game they have, which I'm really excited to see in this game. And then you go to Sam Ellinger. He's a little bit more of a daredevil. He he will take some chances, sometimes to the detriment, throws a couple of picks, but he also makes the big plays. And, John, his legs are vital to this offense, particularly in this game where you've got two healthy running backs on Texas's roster. And I use the term healthy kind of loosely. Keontae air Ingram quotes. is going to be – yes, air quotes. Keontae Ingram is the bell cow, but after him – you have to go down a little bit, and then their third string running back is actually an inside linebacker. So Sam Ellinger's legs are just as important as his arm, but both of them are leaders, and both of them, the offense comes and goes as they do. And, of course, LSU has an army of running backs. One you and I are looking toward is John Emery, who uh, got a little cup of coffee against Georgia Southern, uh, 20 yards and six carries, but this is a guy that can be special. He can be, and Ed Orgeron said it in the post game. You know that he, he, when asked who he reminded him of, he said Reggie Bush, and then he kind of paused and he said, "I don't want to put too much pressure on the kid, but his explosiveness, and his electricness with the ball reminds him of Reggie Bush." And I can see where he's coming from. I think this is a player who could grow into this team and grow into this season when we get to late October, entering November. John Emery could end up being the X factor for this offense. I'm kind of intrigued about it, the both teams' defenses because you're, you're, you know, we've always talked about Texas and and trying to build that defense up, and um, you know, have they got that accomplished? And that Texas defense going up against that LSU offense, uh, who's got the advantage? Well, that's a really good question. You may want to uh, grab a drink because I'm going to wax poetic here a little bit. Um, let's start off. Yeah, I see you got your cup there. Let's start off, first of all, with Texas's defense. This secondary is very good, and I like LSU's secondary. I think they're one of the best in college football. I don't think Texas secondary is very far behind, and I think a lot of people are reading a little too much in Texas stats last week against Louisiana Tech where they gave up over 300 yards passing. But what you got to look at, John, most of those yards were given up in garbage time. It was the fourth quarter. The game was out of reach. Texas was playing some depth guys, trying to get some guys experience. So the stats got padded a little bit. But when you look at just the pure secondary that Texas is going to start this game with, it's hard to find anyone better, and it all starts with Caden Stearns. Caden Stearns, their safety, was a freshman All-American. He's going to be an All-American this year. And, by the way, he was committed to LSU before flipping to Texas on signing day. So he's going to have a little chip on his shoulder to get in this game and make some plays as well. Uh, I really like Jalen Green, the corner. I feel like he doesn't get talked about enough in this Texas secondary because a lot of the safeties get all the love. But he's a really important player in this defense. The one weakness in Texas secondary, and I think this is going to be important, is the other side of the cornerback position because they're still trying to figure out who's going to take that spot. Is it going to be Kobe Boyce? Is it going to be Anthony Cook? Is it going to be Deshaun Jameson? They need to figure out who they trust the most to face these LSU wide receivers who are very gifted. Because if they start rotating guys in and out, I think that will be a weakness that LSU keys on in the secondary. Now let's talk LSU's passing game, John, because that's kind of been the talk of college football other than the upsets. I would say LSU's offense has been a pretty highly debated topic, wouldn't you say? Oh, gosh, yes. Uh, so let's talk about why that is. Steve Insminger, offense coordinator, he's back. He's been around for a while. He's been with Ed since Ed got there. He's not the difference. So what has the difference been? The difference has been Joe Brady. Here's a story of a man named Brady. Joe Brady has come from the New Orleans Saints where he was an offensive analyst, 
and learned under Sean Payton. Joe Brady is a young coach, and he got hired to come to LSU to bring the offensive passing schemes that Sean Payton had taught him to LSU's offense. So what does that look like? We'll go back and watch the LSU game from this past week against Georgia Southern. I watched it twice, John, and I'll tell you what I saw. I saw a mostly five wide receiver sets. I saw three wide receivers, one tight end, and one back the other times. And that was their favorite formation. They had the three wide receivers lined up on the strong side. They take a tight end, 50% on the line, 50% a little bit off the line, and line him on the weak side, and then they play their single back. Now let's talk about their route trees and what they were trying to do. What this offense is doing is they're splitting the secondary into levels. They're sending two guys deep. So you got your wide receiver and your tight end. They're taking the safeties, okay? Then you got your other two wide receivers that are coming across, usually doing slants or drag route and taking away the middle. So you're giving Joe Burrow levels to read, and then you're swinging out your running back. Now it's taking away his blocking. He doesn't have any protection in the backfield, but what it's giving him is quick reads to make. And as long as he's getting rid of that ball quickly, he's having success. And I think that's key in this game because I think in this game, the running backs catching out of the backfield are going to be just as important as wide receivers because we know that Texas defense likes to be aggressive. And the more aggressive they are, the more we're going to see those swing passes come to the outside, which is going to make them adjust. And then the second half may open up deep field passes for Joe Burrow in this LSU offense. That That's kind of what I think we're going to see in the passing game against the secondary. The other question is, can Texas get a pass rush? They have not been able to yeah. get one organically. So they right. may have to send some pressure, send Caden Stern on some safety blitzes, send a corner blitz. Can Joe Burrow pick on that up on that enough? That seems to be Joe Burrow's strength is reading defenses, getting the ball out quick, and making quick decisions. So I think this new passing scheme with Joe Brady is a perfect fit for Joe Burrow in this offense. Yeah, I don't think you're going to get in-depth analysis like that on any other college football podcast, in my opinion. That was great stuff. Uh, of course, Anthony, if you were at the game, would and it was tailgating. Would you go LSU route with the Cajun food, or would you go Texas route with the barbecue? Oh my goodness, do I have to pick that? That's a tough one, man. Um, that would even yeah. be a coin flip for me. I sam- I sample both. I, was I wear say, I wear orange and purple. Can, I wear can we, colors. <laughs> can we do both? Can we be neutral and get shared to yes. both tailgates? And here's the thing: both fan bases are great. They'll both invite yeah. you in. You're not going to be left yeah. out. Yeah, and they'll give you a cold beverage that uh, will make you feel really good uh, to, to enjoy your uh, your cuisine. All right, um, it's time for our picks. Who do you like in this one? Well, you know, LSU, we mentioned about their passing game. Let's talk about real quick about Texas, and I think this will be the difference. We mentioned the depth issues Texas has at running back because they only have Keontae Ingram, who last week said himself was only 80%. He needs to be 100%. But if he has problems running the ball against this LSU front, which I think we all believe he will, that's going to mean Sam Ellinger is going to have to be a big factor in the run game as much as the pass game. Not just running the ball, but also the RPOs and making reads. He has got to be vital in making this LSU defense think before they act. I think they're going to be fired up to start this game. I think it will be a close game. But I think in the second half, Sam Ellinger is going to force some plays, and this LSU defense will capitalize. I think Levon or Levon Lachason will have some sacks in this game from LSU. I think he might have a breakout game for this LSU defense, and I think the pressure will get to him. He'll have a couple of turnovers. I'm going 30 to 17, somewhere in that a 10 to 13 point win for the Tigers. I like LSU too. Uh, a lot of the same reasons why you do. I, I just think um, Joe Burrow is a he's a dynamic quarterback. He he uh, you know he doesn't really wow you, but he just makes plays. And uh, I think uh, he, he's perfect in that role. You know, you you, you brought up Joe Brady. Um, I think it's interesting that John Robinson is is also a consultant to Ed Orgeron. Yes. I think John Robinson is like eighty five years old. You know, people don't understand what a brilliant offensive mind he is. I mean, 
think about his USC offenses uh, his first time around with uh, he had Heisman Trophy running backs, uh, Ricky Bell and Charles White. And, uh, you know, they had really good quarterbacks, too. Uh, it was just – and the offensive lines were massive. And then he goes to the – pushes in the NFL with the Rams and still has the same kind of success with the, with the offense that he used at Southern Cal. Of course, it helped when he had Eric Dickerson in the backfield, too. Uh, but – uh, I think he's made a difference in that offense too, because he sees things from that consulting standpoint, and he's very old school and he's very brilliant. So I, I think it was a great move by Ed Orgeron to bring uh, John Robinson into the fold. Uh, so I'm going to go with LSU too. So we're it's a sweep uh, for the Tigers. Let's talk about another big time matchup at Death Valley and Clemson between Texas A&M and um, and Clemson. Uh, the defending national champions, Jimbo Fisher and Dabo Sweeney meet again. Uh, you thought this they ne- wouldn't meet again until when Jimbo left Florida State, but yeah, uh, this is the second year in a row they've met, so they're familiar with each other. Uh, but I love the defensive coordinator coordinator matchup between Mike Elko and Brent Venables, two of the best in the business. Oh man, I'm so glad you brought that up because these are two of the most underrated defensive coordinators in the country and And should be head coaches. They should be. And you know also too, John, I know you agree with me on this. They're pretty similar in their styles. They both they're kind of underrated in the fact that you don't think pressure when you think Brent Venables or Mike Elko. You think about defenses that keep things in front of them. But I think that they're two of the most disciplined defensive coordinators in college football. Because they pick their spots, and they also know when to lean on their pass rush from their front four to not stress their secondary and their linebackers. They're two very balanced, very good defense coordinators who are similar in their approaches, but also are very good at adapting to what the offense has given them. And do you find it interesting that when you read the, the, the national press, how much disrespect Dabo Sweeney is getting Compared to Jimbo Fisher, um, it, it just seems like that uh, whatever Dabo Swinney does, and he's won two national championships, uh, the respect uh, nationally just isn't there. And, and you're seeing some articles where people feel that Jimbo Fisher is a better coach and will always be a better coach than uh, Dabo. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know if that's the case. I know both of them pretty well. Um, I, they're very different individually. Uh, but, um, you know, uh, I can't, uh, you know, differentiate, differentiate between the two. I mean, one has a national championship, one has two to me, they're, uh, they're peers and they're very successful. Well, Dabo Swinney has been painted as the, you know, most successful CEO head coach in the history of college football. And that's what the media has painted him as. And I do think that that had some merit when you look back at the turnaround, you know, I don't even have to ask you this question. I'm going to ask it, and then I'm going to answer it for you. What was the turnaround sure. for Dabo Swinney at Clemson? It's when he brought in Chad Morris to run his offense. Right. And I do think that at that time, Dabo was having a hard time scheming up game plans offensively because he'd never done it before. Well, he went strength. Being, yes, he went from being a wide, a wide receivers coach straight to being a head coach. I do think, though, that it goes very underrated how much Dabo has learned from some of the great coordinators that he's had on his staff. Mm -hmm. And everybody makes a big deal about the continuity that he's had on his staff. And it is impressive. I do think Dabo gives a little bit more freedom to his coordinators than your, you know, stereotypical successful college football head coach. But I also think that Dabo brings a lot to the table that we don't know about. Dabo's in these meetings. He's in these scheme meetings. He's picked up a lot of things and he does contribute. He just knows when to step back. And Dabo does not have the ego that some of these other successful head coaches have to where they have to have their hands all over it, such as Jimbo Fisher. Jimbo Fisher is one of the best coaches around right now, but Jimbo Fisher, if it's going to screw up, he wants it to screw up because of something that he did. He doesn't like giving trust to his staff. If it's on if the game's on the line, he wants to be the one that puts his neck on the line. So I think that's the difference is the, Dabo Swinney has more trust, and he doesn't have the ego that gets in the way. Not saying one way is better than the other. I just think it's different styles. No, I, I totally agree. Uh, Jimbo Fisher is just just a bit short of being a, a control freak. 
uh, he has his hands in everything, but offense is his thing and quarterbacks. And uh, he, he's all over that as well. But, uh, you know, this is a tremendous matchup. Uh, the, you know, when you look at it on paper, uh, talent-wise, Clemson's got a lot of talent. But Texas A&M has really built themselves up really well. And, you know, they're not going to come into Death Valley and be intimidated. And this could be a little bit of a hard game for Clemson fans to watch at Death Valley on Saturday, especially when they're there. Well, I guarantee you Texas A&M thinks they're going to win this game. The entire, the entire yes, roster they do. and coaching I'm getting staff that. believe they're going to win this game. Um, you mentioned Jimbo Fisher. Not only is he very control freak, he's also probably the best game day play caller in college football. Oh, by far. When it comes to adjustments in a game, I don't think there's anybody better on the sideline on Saturday than Jimbo Fisher when it comes to his offense. So well, you always have that wild card you could throw in there. Well, I would say if you're at Death Valley on Saturday, or even when he was bringing Florida State teams in, watch every time Kellen Mon comes to the sideline. He's going to meet yeah. him halfway there, and it's teacher and pupil every time. And, and I've asked him, I asked him about this years ago and he's always asking, what'd you see? Why'd you make this read when this read was happening? Very much a teacher pupil type of thing. And some people can react well to that. And some people can't. Absolutely. And Kellamon will get all the talk going into this game, previewing it. I, I think we need to spend some time on the running game though, John, for Texas A&M. Oh, they yes. have really bolstered up this running game. And they really were trying to prove a point last week and running the ball and running the ball and running the ball to get reps and get comfortable. And I think they're going to be able to find a running game. They like to run the ball by committee. I do think long term that they're running back. Maybe Isaiah Spiller, the true freshman. Mm -hmm. He's pretty special. He, he has breakaway ability. And I think eventually they're going to be able to lean on him and let him take over for this running game. But for now, they're going to rotate a couple of different guys in. Deshaun Corbin is probably going to be their main carrier. He's also a little shifty, but he runs hard up the middle. He runs bigger than what he is. And I think that the balance for the running game is going to be important. Now, this offensive line, let's talk this offensive line for A&M. This offensive line has some questions coming into the season. They run block pretty well. I, I thought they ran block well in the last game, and I think that they will have some success against an unproven Clemson defensive line run blocking in this game. The question I have is pass blocking on the bookends. Can right and left tackle and the tight ends help pick up that defensive end pass rush? They had some problems in the last game. They really did. They weren't able to keep a clean pocket. And if these guys get leaned on in the second half, that could be the difference if they can't block from his blind side. He, Kellen Mond might have some issues and take some sacks. And, of course, on the other side, there's Trevor Lawrence, who had a nice warm-up act against Georgia Tech. But this is big time now for Trevor Lawrence. And, you know, I, I remember talking to Dabo Sweeney uh, during fall camp uh, how Trevor's getting better. And a lot of it is because of the fact that he can watch himself on film now and uh, he can uh, correct his mistakes at the college level. Uh, but this is a game where Trevor Lawrence needs to be the Trevor Lawrence we know and love uh, that can make plays. Uh, I think he's going to be harassed a lot by that Texas A&M defense. You know, I, I think the world of Mike Elko. I think he's a, he's a great player. He's a great coach that can prepare, that can prepare a defense uh, for any offense that they they uh, encounter, and uh, I think Travis Etienne, or I'm sorry, Trevor Lawrence is going to see some uh, some exotics here and there. I agree with you, and you know a lot of people were making a big deal about his struggles last week. It, it was a warm up game; he threw two picks, yeah, but yeah. it's week one. He's building this way into the season. His wide receiving core is one of the best in college football, if not the best. And those guys are going to help him out a lot. I think they are going to put a lot of stress on this A&M secondary. Now, this A&M secondary might be the best secondary that Trevor Lawrence sees in the regular season. Not only are they athletic, but they're long. They average 6'2 to 6'3 across the entire secondary. Yeah. So those one-on-one -on -one jump balls that he loves to throw – 
may be contested a little more than what he normally sees. So that'll be interesting to see how they adjust that. But you mentioned on a slip-up earlier, but you kind of gave it away, Travis Etienne is probably going to be the difference in this game. Travis yeah, Etienne is. is the closer for this offense. He may not make a big noise in the first half, but he's got that Dalvin Cook quality about him that as the game wears on, he runs better. And by the fourth quarter is when he really shines. And that's probably going to be the difference because Trevor Lawrence is going to face a lot of pressure in this game. And I think Trevor Lawrence is going to have some ups and downs. If Travis Etienne can have success, Clemson should still be able to find the win, I think. I agree. And and going to your height issue, I mean, T. Higgins, 6'4", Justin Ross, 6'4", DeAndre Overton, 6'4", Joseph Nagata, 6'3". But A&M's, you're right about A&M secondary. I mean, Miles Jones is 6'4". Uh, I imagine he's going to be going up against uh, one of those guys uh, pretty uh, regularly. And then you got uh, rest 6'1", 6'2". So you're right. I mean, A&M is long and lean and got some size to him in the secondary. That's going to be an interesting matchup. I can't wait to to, to watch that unfold. Okay, I agree. So, and let's talk real quick about the other side. A&M's got some wide receivers too, John. I mean, these guys last year, you know, everybody made a big deal about Clemson's wideouts. I thought A&M's wide receivers were the stars in this matchup last year in College Station. They were. And it really, it really carried them through the rest of the year. You know, this A&M offense was not clicking on all cylinders when these two teams met a year ago. But they're comfortable now, and these wide receivers at A&M, they don't take a back seat to anybody. And I think they're going to give Clemson's secondary a lot of stress as well. So Clemson's going to have to – they're going to have to disguise some coverages, try to confuse Kellen Mond, because if they start playing man coverage and trying to send the blitz or two, they're going to get beat. Well, that was the weak point of Clemson's defense last year was that secondary. And uh, it's not it's supposed to be better this year. But, that, again, I think on both sides of the ball, you're right. The wide receiver uh, defensive back matchup for both teams is going to be great to watch. It'll be good, uh, be good football to watch. Now, uh, the outcome of this game. Um, we can give our predictions now as well, but you know, I, I tend to like Texas A&M in this game simply because I think they're, I'd love the way how Jimbo Fisher prepares a team for these type of ball games, especially on the road. And they're, they're on a mission to bring Haggy football back and Clemson has yet to be tested. Uh, it's been a while, uh, since the Tigers were tested, probably the Syracuse game, uh, when, um, after the, uh, after, um, um, but the quarterback transfer and, uh, Chase Bryce had to come in and, and rescue Trevor Lawrence who, who had to leave the game. I think that maybe that was the last time Clemson was tested in this game and they're going to be tested in this game. And I t- tend to like A&M in this game as well. I don't think a loss will hurt Cle- Clemson's chances of getting back in the playoff, but I just think a and on a mission. Well, a couple of things. First of all, you're right. It will not hurt Clemson's chances of making the playoff. Second of all, you mentioned the game last year against Syracuse after Kelly Bryant had transferred. Yes, Kelly and Bryant. And Chase Bryce had to come in due to Trevor Lawrence's injury. Here's what did you know this. Ever since that game, Clemson has won every game they've played by 20 points or more. Yeah. Including both their playoff matchups. Right, now, right. That's what I mean. Now, let me say this, though. You brought up a good point about Jimbo having his team ready. On the flip side, for all the praise we give Dabo Sweeney, and for much as we love Dabo, Dabo, to me, has become the master at revving his teams up through a season yeah. and making his teams peak at the right time. Right time being mid to early November yeah. is when they really start hitting their stride. So if you want to play Clemson and beat them, you want them early, without a doubt. They are slow starters out of the gate. Traditionally, for the last ever since they've really been a national power, they've always started slow. I think that AM is catching them at a good time. And I think AM believes that they're going to win this football game. At the end of the day, though, I still think Clemson pulls it out. Because I think A&M is not quite there as a roster. I think they can just about play with Clemson tit for tat for the starting 22. But once you start rotating guys and once you get late into the fourth quarter, 
I don't know if A&M has enough juice to hang with Clemson. And with it being on the road, I think Clemson in the end will pull this out in a close game. I'm going to go a six-point game, 27-21. It'll be a great game, nail-biter, but I think Clemson gets out unscathed. 34-31, Texas A&M. Uh, I'm going to go out on a limb on this one. And this I is love it. Limb. I hope you're right. I've, this is a limb I've went, I think I've gone off on, from the get-go when we started our preview shows. Um, so uh, before we go to lightning round, there's one other matchup that really intrigues Anthony and I, and that's BYU at Tennessee. I was all, you say that. <laughs> they, we all know what happened to Tennessee against Georgia State, and it was embarrassing. BYU's coming off a loss to Utah, their in-state rival, and they hung with the Utes pretty much throughout the game. Um, I really like BYU's makeup right now. I love Zach Wilson. Uh, they they call him Mr. Hair Gel in Provo. Uh, but, I mean, he may look good but it, off the field, but, man, he's really looking good on the field. I mean, he's a guy that can really mess things up for Tennessee's defense, especially if they're uninspired. But I really like that offensive line of, of BYU as well. Um, they're, they're aggressive. They're physical. And uh, they create holes not only for Zach Wilson, but for Tyson Williams. And uh, they give uh, Zach Wilson time to throw. This is a game that BYU can, can win at, at Neyland. Well, let's be honest, John. Two weeks ago, I'm going to take you back to two weeks ago. We had left a padded room. We were standing in the hallway, me and you having a conversation. And we were talking about games coming up. And we brought up this matchup in week two. And we yeah. said, that's an interesting game yeah. because we knew going into the season that Tennessee was a question mark on both sides of the line of scrimmage and that BYU strength was on both sides of the line of scrimmage. Well, week one, I think, showed that we didn't even realize how much of a strength it was going to be for BYU because that was supposed to be Utah's strength. And I know they lost by yeah. 18 in the Holy War. I get that. They beat Utah on both lines of scrimmage for a very long portion of that game. Yeah, at on least the flip, two and a half quarters. Absolutely. On the flip side of that, Tennessee's woes on the offensive and defensive lines were, looked even worse in week one than what we thought. So, yeah, I think the line of scrimmage battle, it's BYU and it's not even close. Now, the question is going to be, can the skill players at Tennessee overcome that difference? I didn't think Jaron Garitano played as bad as people are making him out to be. I really didn't. I know that there are a lot of questionable throws that he made, but he had the fluky fumble play where it bounced off his wide receiver's hands like eight times. He had a lot of pressure under him. The fan base was turning in the stadium. I thought that the offensive game plan by Jim Chaney wasn't terrible. It just didn't adapt when the game was turning against them. But I think if they can keep everything in front of them, Garantano can make the plays he, here. And we alluded to this earlier in the show. The big question for me is, does this team want to play for this coaching staff? Mm -hmm. And this is their Waterloo. This yeah. is their moment. They, if they don't stand up this week, you may be looking at a three and nine, four and eight at best Tennessee season. This is their Waterloo, John. They have to step up. They cannot lose this game. It's crazy to say that in week two, but now this has went from being a game where it was going to be close to a must-win situation for Tennessee and for their head coach. Before we give our predictions, I want to play a crazy scenario for you, John. Let's say BYU wins this football game, okay? Yeah. And then Tennessee gets into the season, and they just loss after loss after loss starts piling up. Do we see a Barry Alvarez scenario at Tennessee where at the end of the season when Vanderbilt's coming up, the AD gets onto the field and coaches this football team? And I'm not even going to say his name because you know who he is. Wouldn't shock me. <laughs> because I think people will, uh, I, at least I think that, uh, the uh, AD that shall be named later at Tennessee is turned into a Barry Alvarez starter kit. And um, yeah, I can see that happening. Um, Absolutely. I mean, he hired let, him. Let me, yeah. And let me put it to you this way. Think about it like this. Okay. Their schedule. Let's say they lose to BYU. 
they'll beat UT Chattanooga, you would think. So they'll be one and two. <laughs> then they play. Then you they think? play Florida, loss, loss. Georgia, loss. loss, Mississippi State, loss right now. Yeah, Alabama, yeah. Loss. loss, South Carolina, uh, I don't know. We'll see. Okay, so maybe one more win there. So they could be at two wins. UAB, eh, uh, okay, sure, whatever. At Kentucky, <laughs> at Missouri, Vanderbilt, Loss. they're not winning all those games. No. When they get to November, could Phil Fulmer say, look, the team's given up on our head coach. We have to part ways. We have to pay us buyout. We can't yeah. afford to hire a new coach and pay for a new coach. So I'm going to bite the bullet. I'm going to coach this team until we're financially stable. Could that happen? Yeah, that is one crazy scenario, but knowing what football has been like at Tennessee the last three years, it could happen. It's, Without it's a possible. Doubt. Without a there, doubt. I'm yeah, looking at John right now scratching his head. John's scratching his head in disbelief, but he's also <laughs> nodding in approval. So it's crazy, <laughs> but oh that could gosh. happen. So, so and for you and that I reason, know some Tennessee alums that would probably just go, probably jump into the river. Oh my goodness. It's, I don't even want to think about the turmoil that would be caused from that. With that said, they have to win against BYU. Yeah. They have yeah. to win. So I'm yeah. going to take Tennessee even though they're worse on both lines of scrimmage, and even though I don't know if this team wants to play for their staff, because I want to believe that Jeremy Pruitt has got this team going in the right direction, I'm going to say Tennessee 26-24, to 24, a two-point game, but that they get the win they need. And I'm going to go the opposite way. I'm going to go BYU 28, Tennessee 24, I think the tailgate is going to be very tepid at Neyland before the game, and there are going to be a lot of groans going on in Neyland as the game ends. And very very quietly, people will be getting their cars, driving home wherever in Tennessee or where, wherever these Tennessee fans are, and it'll be a very quiet ride home. Well, and you always go for chaos, so I'm not surprised yes, by that. Yes. I will say, too, you know, somebody mentioned to me earlier, well, it's in Neyland. So that's a benefit for Tennessee, right? I say no. I think <laughs> no. that's a disadvantage because if they look sloppy, that stadium will turn on them. Yeah. Can they move it to uh, where the Titans play? Yeah, there you go. Let's play a neutral site game. There's play, <laughs> Let's play in Chattanooga. Who doesn't want to yeah. go to Chattanooga? Right, right, yeah. Or they can bring it down to Mercedes-Benz. Yeah, they have a really nice stadium at Pittman High School in Gatlinburg. They could play there, right? That's in the true. That's true. That's true. Okay. A fan favorite and one Anthony likes to do, it's the lightning round. So, Anthony, I turn it over to you. Okay. Let's start off Friday night, John. The Marshall Thundering Herd are traveling across the country, going to some mountains, taking on Boise State with their freshman quarterback coming off a big win. John, who do you like? I'm going to go Boise State, uh, and I think they're going to win it handily. Uh, I love that Boise State team, the way that their makeup is. And that quarterback, uh, Bachman, is absolutely fantastic as a true freshman. I agree. A lot of people think Boise State may have a hangover. I don't think so. I think Hank Bachmeyer no. has hit a stride. Bach I like Bachmeyer, Boise State you. in this game as well. Big. Okay, Saturday, a noon game. This one interests me, John. Army going to Ann Arbor. Now, don't forget last year, Army went to Norman and almost beat Oklahoma and cost yeah. them a chance in the playoffs just by taking them to overtime. So yeah. now it's Jim Harbaugh's turn. Do they give Michigan headaches? Yes, they do, because they're going to control the clock, and I think they've got some pretty a good quarterback and running backs. They're, they're deceptively good. Uh, I think Jim Harbaugh and the Wolverines are very nervous, but they get the win, and it's going to be a 17-14 to 14 type of game. I think Michigan wins this game in a close one as well, and I think it might be 10 points at the end, but I think Harbaugh's going to look confused and aggravated and irritated. Well, that sounds like what he normally looks like, but I think he may extra look like that on Saturday. You agree? All right, let's move on now to a game I love, and I'm going to go ahead and call this one before you pick it. Syracuse traveling to take on Maryland in the Terps. Head coach Mike Loxley coming off a fine 79 points. In week one, Syracuse rolls in. Now, Syracuse plays Clemson next week. And I'm going to tell you now, this is going to be the spoiler. Maryland will knock off Syracuse, catch them sleeping. The offense isn't clicking yet, it doesn't look like. 
I think Maryland beats the Q's. Do you agree? I agree. I'm going with the Turks. Wow. That two for two. There you go. Go ahead and bank it. It's over with. All right, let's move on now. Vanderbilt heading up to Purdue. Both teams are 0-1. Vanderbilt can feel good about a 20-something point loss. Purdue cannot feel good about going to Nevada and getting upset on a Friday night. They both need to win. I think Purdue gets it. What say you? I, I do too. I think Purdue is the much better team here. And they got I think they were embarrassed in, in Reno. Uh game they felt they should have win. Uh, I think Vanderbilt is going to get a beat down. All right, let's move on. West Virginia travels to Mizzou, Columbia, Missouri, one of your favorite places. Does Missouri get healthy this week? They get healthy, but that, that that's an in, intriguing matchup. You know, I, I wish Neil Brown had a little better talent because I think they could get it done. But, you know, what kind of psyche is Missouri going to have in this one? What uh, is Larry Roundtree going to get some care, more carries, and will he be effective? I like Missouri, but it's going to be a close one. I think Austin Kendall for West Virginia, the Oklahoma transfer, could have a good game, especially yeah. early in this game. The yeah. problem is West Virginia has no balance. They can't run the football. Because of that, I think Missouri, their back's against the wall. I do think they win this game maybe by 20, 21 points. But I think West Virginia can hang in for a little bit. Okay, to the ATL we go. South Florida, who got ran off. They're still getting ran on right now. Now travels up and takes on Georgia Tech, making his – Home coaching debut, Jeff Collins. What do you think is going to happen in this one? I think Georgia Tech is better uh, than they showed against Clemson. Um, so I'm going to go with the Yellow Jackets because obviously South Florida beat them last year. South Florida's got some issues being able to stop the run. Uh, this is a this is a win for Georgia Tech and Jeff Collins is first on the flats, and everybody will be tailgating at Waffle House. You know, I full disclosure, I talked with Jeff Collins yesterday, and after speaking with him in person, I, how can you not love this guy? I, everything oh, yeah. he's selling, I mean, he just he lives and breathes his program, and he was talking about the seats and where he sat at when he was a kid and yeah. watching the JV Georgia-Georgia Tech game. It is a dream job, and that's a lot of people don't really believe that, but that is 100% true. I I th- I don't think he wins though. <laughs> I think South Florida South beats Florida? him in a close one. I-, I think Georgia Tech, as good as they looked against Clemson, they have a long way to go. I don't think they're ready for this one. Okay, let's move on to one of my favorite rivalries from the '90s. Nebraska heads to Boulder and takes on Colorado. John, what's going to happen? Well, shameless plug here on the uh, college football rivalries and trophy game show. I interviewed Nate Rohr, the pre and post game host for uh, the Husker Sports Network, and uh, he uh, he's somewhat of a historian and talked about uh, the glory days of the late 80s and 90s between this one. This was an interesting one because Nebraska really didn't show much um, in their home, in their opener last week. Colorado really kind of ran roughshod on Colorado State in the Rocky Mountain Showdown. I'm going to lean toward Colorado in this one because I th- I think Mel Tucker has done a great job in motivating his his buffs and uh, I, I it's in Boulder and I just like the Buffaloes in this game I, you know they I don't think Nebraska could not stop Lavisca Chenault last year and I don't think they're going to do it again. They can put all five DBs on LaVisca Chenault, and he's still going to make catches. Steven Montez, a really good quarterback for Colorado. The offense is a difference. Colorado will win this game. I do want to say keep an eye on Wondell Robinson, the wide receiver for Nebraska, true freshman yeah. from Kentucky. This kid's going to be special. They can really build this offense around him, but it won't be enough on Saturday. Okay, San Diego State goes to UCLA. Chip Kelly, does he get a win? No, Aztecs. Wow, I knew you were going to long. Rocky Long. I knew you were going to. That's why I threw that out. I disagree, though. I do, I'm do. i going to give Chip Kelly the benefit of the doubt. Even though Dorian Thompson-Robinson looked awful in week one, I think they somehow ugly find a way to win. All right, I've been waiting to talk this game with John for a whole week. The Arkansas Razorbacks go to Oxford to take on the Rebels of Ole Miss. Loser, probably winless in the conference. Do your hogs get it done, John? I think they do. Uh, they struggled against Portland State offensively, uh, but Ole Miss struggled mightily against uh, offensively against Memphis. 
Uh, and I think Arkansas's defense is a lot better than they've been in the past. They're still not really an SEC type defense, but you know, they're getting guys down and the games in Oxford, um, both, right. Both teams, this is, <laughs> this game should be played at the end of the season, really, because it's for bowl eligibility, uh, in my opinion. Uh, but I think the Razorbacks get it done. They'll win by 10 and they will be disarray at Ole Miss. And you and I will start talking about Matt Luke and his job security. Yep. And we'll start talking about Mike McIntyre taking over as the interim head coach. I, I like Arkansas as well. I think that Arkansas's run game is the difference. Oh, yeah. I think that their knowns are more experienced. Ben Hicks will be methodical and not turn it over. And I think Matt Corral will force the ball, make some mistakes. And I think Arkansas wins this game. Okay. We're wrapping up here. So a couple more, let me go through them real quick. Nevada at Oregon, Nevada is Oregon going to have a hangover. Can Nevada pull any kind of upset from their momentum they got from week one? Yeah, I think they can be Nevada. Um, now, Nevada is, has a little bit of momentum going in after defeating Purdue, but Ogden Stadium is a tough place to play. Oregon's pissed off, and uh, I think when you piss off Marco, Mario Cristobal, you're going you're gonna to pay, and unfortunately, ne- Nevada is going to pay. Yeah, I think there's two options here. Oregon either comes in for a letdown or they come angry. I think they show up angry. I think they blow Nevada out the window. Okay, Miami. Heads up to Chapel Hill to take on the ACC Coastal favorite. If you listen to some of the pundits in Charlotte, the North Carolina Tar Heels and the wonder <laughs> coach of Mac Brown. Do they get to 2-0 and and win their first conference game? The legend of Sam Howe has begun. This is intriguing because do, will the two coaches talk before the game? Or will there be a post-game handshake? Because you know the history between Mac Brown and Manny oh, Diaz. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I think there's going to be a little ripple effect there. You know, Miami defense uh, is really good, uh, but their offense, if, if they're, if they cannot block like they did against Florida, then I think it's a long afternoon for Jaron Williams and, and the hurricanes, uh, North Carolina. Uh, how do they back up a, a win like that? Uh, s- such a different game. I'm going to lean toward the Tar Heels in this game. Uh, because they are home. It's their home opener. And, you know, I, I think Sam Howell might be the real deal. Uh, a special quarterback. Uh, and we now we know why Mac Brown, after his uh, introductory press conference, got in a car and went over to see Sam Howell immediately. Uh, so I'm going to go with the Tar Heels. Yeah, I, I think Sam Howell can be special. But I, I'm going Miami. They had the week off. This front seven, I think it's going to give North Carolina a lot of problems. Yeah. I think they're going to get in Sam Howell's face, knock him around, give him pressure he couldn't see in South Carolina. I think he sees it in this game. I like Miami in this game, but I do think North Carolina will have a good showing. All right, let's go West Coast now. Cal at Washington. Can Jeff Tedford upset Chris Peterson's Huskies? No. All right, moving on. Yeah, I agree, with with that. <laughs> I agree with that. All right, Minnesota goes to Fresno State. This is an interesting game. Ooh. Minnesota, a lot of people really liked them, me included, coming into the season, but then they've had some quarterback injuries. They've had to go down the depth chart. Can they get 2-0? and Can they get past Fresno State? I don't know. Fresno State kind of surprised me. Um, you know, I, th- I thought they could uh, uh, get a win last week, um, but – I'm going to go with the Gophers. I mean, I, I got a good feeling about them. Uh, they're a lot more balanced this year, and, uh, you know, they, they need a win. So, uh, and Fresno's, you know, kind of down this year. So I'm going to go with the Gophers. It'll probably be a close one. Yeah, I agree with you. It'll be extremely close. I do think Minnesota gets the win, though. And Stanford heads up to USC and all their quarterback woes in a game Clay Helton really has to win, also, yeah. to keep the dogs off his back. Well, Stanford's going to win. Does he get that win? No, Stanford's going to win this game. And USC, um, you know, does this begin the downward spiral? And can they come up with the money for a buyout for uh, for their head coach, um, Clay Helton? So I'm going to go with Stanford in this one. It's going to, you know, Stanford played USC pretty historically pretty well. So I'm going to go with the Cardinal. Yeah, I think Stanford's defense is the difference in an ugly game, 20-9. to nine. And, yes, I agree with you. 
this will be the beginning of the end for Clay Helton. And finally, to wrap it all up, Coastal Carolina goes to Lawrence, Kansas to take on the return of Puka Williams. Can Les Miles go 2-0 and with the Jayhawks? Yes, they'll go 2-0, and and they'll be celebrating in Lawrence because they're four games away from bowl eligibility. Totally agreed, and that is your lightning round for week two. So it's great to be able to talk games uh, with you, Anthony, and uh, after uh, an I, I, opening week hiatus. And, uh, uh, of course, next week we'll do it again, but uh, that was fun. It's uh, we got some really good, intriguing matchups. Yeah, we do. This week two to me is even more intriguing than week one was. We saw the excitement that week one brought. I think week two will continue to bring the excitement. All right. And then we remind you, you can hear our podcast on uh, on Spreaker, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, iTunes, where uh, SoundCloud, wherever you uh, listen to your podcast. And uh, so enjoy the games out there. Uh, we'll be back next week with another college football debrief for Anthony Goldman. I'm John Wilkerson. So long, everyone.